Well, Me thank too. you so much, Iconics. And uh, as Chris said, my name is Candy Shaw, AKA the Bali Lama. I am sitting here with a piece of history. My father who, uh, you know, well, says he's a legend in his own mind, of course, but really um, before influencers were influencers, this man was truly an influencer, a man of great grace uh, and dignity and power in our industry. Some of your listeners might be a little too young to remember dad when I used to say when, or the, the insurance commercial that used to say when EF Hutton speaks, everyone listens. And to be honest, I felt like all of my career when my father spoke, everyone listened. Uh, he's a man of great wisdom, a lot of funny jokes too. So I'm certain he's going to give me a one or two one-liners and all his seriousness. And I did realize dad that we both have on these collars today. That wasn't planned. I guess, I don't know, maybe we thought we were going to the bank or something to get some money. I don't know. But nonetheless, um, I think what everyone wants to know today is uh, a bit about your career, a bit about how you got started. So why in the world did you decide to become a hairdresser? I had a job selling beauty and barber supplies, traveling the state of Alabama. Uh, I don't know how I got the job. I just did. I knew nothing of the beauty business and nothing of the anything. I had some experience as a, a barber, but very little. <clears throat> I went to a beauty show in Birmingham, Alabama. The owner of the supply house I was working for took me there. And I saw this guy up on a stage doing hair and all of these girls sitting in the audience mooning like it was Elvis. And I said, that's for me. <laughs> <laughs> that's for me i quit the traveling job and started the beauty school the next monday so i went to beauty school three weeks and in my experience of cutting hair after three weeks at that school i was teaching the class and i said well this is not working so <clears throat> i had seen uh group from California, Comer and Duran, I had a school and I, and they were doing looks. I saw photographs of the looks that they did and I knew it was something I didn't know how to do. So I asked my lovely wife at this time, I said, I want to go to California. And she said, let's go. So I went out and I got went, enrolled in the school in Hollywood. And in three weeks, I was teaching the class, and I realized this ain't right. <laughs> this is not working. So we were homesick, and so we came back, and I went to work in out at a salon in Alabama. Well, the salon of the town in Alabama, I realized it was not going anywhere. You know, they're set in their ways, and I said, if I'm going to really make an impact, in the beauty business, I got to go to a city where things are happening. So I didn't want to go, I, I considered Baltimore and I considered Atlanta. So I chose Atlanta and so we packed up our little vehicle and here we went, we went to Atlanta. And I got a job at the department store and the first week I worked at the department store, I broke the record for the most uh, income that that salon had ever achieved. So I went to cash a check when I got the payday and the guy wanted to know if I worked selling furniture that, that nobody had ever cashed a check this big. So, uh, so one thing led to another and uh, I went to another show and I watched the competition they had. And I saw the winner and I said to myself, mm -mm, I'm better than that. So I entered my first competition and unfortunately I won. So I, that set me on fire. So I watched, you know, it. I have a saying, it's not what you look at, it's what you see. So I watched and I realized that 
I could, the way I could be successful was to outsmart people. And how do you outsmart somebody in a competition? Well, first of all, you got to have the best looking model. So I made a search for the model. My models always, always were a winner without me. You know, before I ever touched their hair, they were a winner. The second thing I realized, I had to make sure I was in the right position. You have to be where the light, in the competition room, you have to be where the light is the best, et cetera, et cetera. And so I spent my career undefeated. Oh, that's All awesome. right, now I'm going to interject because, <laughs> I, and I'm sorry to do that, but I have to, because you just said something that is extremely valuable to all students that are listening to this. And there is a contest that will be, uh, that they will be involved in. When you said the model was a winner, do you want to kind of please, I mean, I know what you mean. I want you to reiterate and kind of break that down to what does that mean to them? You got to be willing to put in the work. You've got to be willing to put in the practice, just like a golfer. He's, the golfer spends a hundred hours in practice and two hours in competition. So you got to be able to put in the work. You got to be able to find the right models and uh, do all the preliminaries. You just can't walk in cold turkey and expect to be successful. Yeah. So you are ready. You are ready. Um, as far as the model goes, when you said the model was a winner already, what made that model a winner? Was she a big modeling agency model that you would work with? No, 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 he didn't have that kind no, of money. No. <laughs> Natural beauty. Okay. All right. Okay, good. Thank you. Great head shape, great hair. Yeah. Yeah. And presumably, Jameson, she let you do whatever you wanted because she adored you anyway. Pardon? I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'll answer that for you. Okay. That she <laughs> do whatever you want because she she's good. She adored you anyway, so she would let you do whatever you wanted to do. So, beautiful girl, you could do what you want. Hey. It has to be a team effort. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. You know, well, actually, I used to always say my mom was a makeup artist, yeah. right? And she modeled a lot for my dad. Yeah. And, and she would do, and, and she <laughs> won a lot of things for him because she would, you know, be doing her face yeah. and getting the front going while yeah. he was getting the back going, you yeah. know? Right. So, a team definitely a team effort for sure. I got another saying you need to write down. You can go in, as far in life as you want to, as long as you don't care who gets the credit. Yeah, that's true. So the model with me always got the credit. But I'd like to talk to you just a second, if I may, why I quit competitions. I quit because I was in New York at the International Beauty Show and I won the competition. And the model and I were going out to dinner and I walked in the restaurant with this model who, whose hair looked like uh, Kool-Aid. You know. And I was ashamed to be seen with her. And I said to myself there, I will never ever again do anything to a beautiful young girl to make her look ugly. And so I quit. I never competed again. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a nugget, Joseph Whitney. <laughs> That's a nugget. There's a nugget, a golden nugget for your students that just remember, you know, it's, you don't have to completely reinvent this person or throw on every color that we've got behind the color bar make the girl look or the man look beautiful and then it's noticed well unfortunately it's uh, in those days competition was like architectural structure it was not about mm -hmm. beauty so uh, well it was more about like almost having a hat on the head if yeah, you, will. Right. you know it was it was right. actually a exactly. uh, something that they built through a lot mm -hmm. of hair pieces and and things of that mm -hmm. nature i remember 
you know, when they would have, dad would have to travel or he would tell stories about when he would have to travel with a lot of his competition pieces, they would be in these humongous boxes and they would have to construct them. So back then, if you saw some of those photos, which I unfortunately have some pictures of these hair pieces, I mean, they're enormous. I mean, they, you know, they would work on them for months, you know, to get them right. So the art of competition though, dad, uh, you know, is really kind of a way of the past. I think now it's the shock value of competition, wouldn't you say? It's like, yeah. the more I can shock you, the more I feel like I'm winning a competition. But, but back then, I mean, this man, to see him sitting here today without a tie around his neck, I mean, he worked every single day of his life and his career behind the chair with a, with a tie on. And that was just the respect that he had for beauty. And mm -hmm. I think that now, you know, I even kind of precursor before this, uh, this interview. And I said, now, dad, don't say anything to make the new generation mad at us, okay? <laughs> because, you yeah. know, he sees life in a different way. Wouldn't yeah. you agree? I agree? What do you think is the difference now and where you were as a hairdresser in your beginning stages uh, than it is here now in 2021. I mean, what do you think is different about us as an industry? Well, it's not what you're Good motivated. One. It's not what you're motivated to do. There's knowledge and there's education out there everywhere. But motivation is very scarce. I don't see the motivation in the young people that I saw in the, the group that I, I work with, I trained or I competed against. We, they had a different motive. We had a different motivation. Now, what did I take out of all of that? I mean, it was, you know, my original salon was called Jameson. <clears throat> and a guy walked in there one day and said, I wanted, a, he wanted to order a trophy. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I thought the next day they painted Jameson Shaw hairdressers on it, you know, because I would, I realized that, you know, I, I, I'm missing something here, you know. So, I, but what I took out of competition, it made me a much better hairdresser. It it was my learning to, you know, I I, I learned so much from it. I, I learned so much about myself. If, if I'm willing to go that mile that it takes, uh, it, it made a better, I became a better employee in my own organization, you know. Uh, so it, if it were to do over, would I do it again? Differently, but yes, I would. Uh, I used candy as my model. <laughs> <laughs> Not hardly. <laughs> I do have good hair, though. I will say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then, then uh, I, I use Candy's granddaughter. She yeah, has great hair. Yeah. Well, I think I think the thing that your viewers need to know is, um, you know, the phone is not the only relationship, you know, that we have in our lives, and the fact that as a child growing up in such a iconic place, I mean, our home was always filled with some incredible people that back then no one knew. I mean, you know, one of the questions that you were asking was, you know, how did you meet Paul Mitchell and how did you meet Vidal Sassoon and, you know, celebrity folks um, or Horse Ruckleback or any of these incredible people. And, and his answer to me was they weren't celebrities then. They were just, you know, they were just hairdressers and, and the relationships that you built each of you taught each other something yeah. special. Wouldn't you say that? Yeah, but Dale changed her diaper. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think people would want to know that, but. That's the kind of relationship we had. They, they, they were, I wasn't a celebrity. They weren't a celebrity. We were just people trying to survive and trying to learn and sharing with them. Uh, they were an inspiration to me. I learned so much from them, uh, uh, each and every one. And I hope that maybe they learned a, a nickel worth from me. Well, and uh, then it wasn't, even though they called it competition, I mean, you would agree with this. 
it was competition by by an event okay you're competing to win a trophy but the reality was there was no competition between each other mm -hmm. as a relationship because they were all handing each other pens or they were helping each other or if your model didn't show up you you know and dad was doing the finger wave competition then maybe he would use your model because his mom you know it was yeah. it was all a, a working no, uh, I, a thing together I, I, I never competed for a trophy right i competed for respect yeah that's true that's all yeah yeah, and and I and I I won a lot of that. I mean, I owe I owe my life uh, fifty nine years behind the beauty chair uh, to that. You know, I learned so much, much, much. You know, I <clears throat> I'm known for this. I I tell people that hairdressing is like a moving train. You can get on it anywhere. The secret is staying on the train. <laughs> and. <clears throat> And if you, without education, the train does not move. So you're looking out the window at the same thing every day, every day, same client, every day, same thing, same thing, same thing. So with education, the train moves. So what I learned today will be different in the salon tomorrow, you know, that type of thing. For I, sure. I can tell you the real secret to a beauty salon, if you want to know. I mean, I think I should know. I had a successful salon for over 50 years. The secret, you want people to work with you, not for you. I never look for anybody to work for me. I look for people that would work with me to help me make a business successful, successful career for other people. <clears throat> and if I found that person, they were extremely valuable. But I don't want, I don't want any for me. Yeah, well, that's true. Makes, yeah. makes a lot of sense. Um, actually, Candy, we have a question for you. In 2017, you were named Atlanta's Small Business Person of the Year. What did that mean to you in respect of the 50-year young business? And has it helped you in other areas of our industry? Well, it has. And that particular um, event was, of course, for being a manufacturer and creating a small business with Sunlights. But one thing that I would always say to dad was when I bought the business from dad, which I did, you know, he would tell me sometimes, hey, I did that before, don't do that. You know, I did that before, don't do that. And one day I got the nerve up to say to him, hey, look, you know, I've got to fall on my own accord and I've got to make my own mistakes. And even though it didn't work for you back in 1972, you know, it might work for me in 1992. You never know, things do change. You know, winning awards are, I mean, Chris, you've got a whole uh, um, suitcases full of them. But the reality is all it does is just keep you wanting to be better, do better, and to live better. It's not something that is an end-all accomplishment. Um, my dad taught me so much about running a business out of love and family and as cliche as the saying would go, you know, when the flower blooms, the bees appear. And one thing that I know from running a business as a woman, it had to be very different than coming from, um, you know, a father's business. And I think I said once before, maybe in your interview, was the moment I felt like there was a pivotal change in our relationship was my whole life. I was introduced as Jameson Shaw's daughter. And the moment I got introduced as, oh, that's Jameson Shaw, Candy <laughs> Shaw's father, I was like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm winning, I'm winning, I'm finally yeah. winning over yeah. here, you know? You know, I have, I have two sons that have big time uh, degrees from major universities, I, you know, major in interview uh, at university but my daughter she went to the toughest college ever and that was she went to the university of dad 
<laughs> so it, it was that's a hard school, people. Boy, let me tell you. I promise you, it's a hard school. I wish I could do it over. I'd make less mistake. <laughs> he gave me a half a day off Christmas. Yeah. That was it. <laughs> I could. I like and you're it. lucky. My dad would not have done that at all. He wanted me to go into his jewelry and watchmaking business, and he was so difficult that I was like. No, so I really have so much respect for you, Candy. I take my, I roll out the red carpet for you. <laughs> I'd like to tell you that Stan, uh, Candy's history of hairdressing. She came to work with me one Saturday when she was eight years old. I gave her the broom and she swept the floor. That night she came to me and she said, Dan, I need to talk to you. And I said, yes, you what? Listen, you can get anybody to sweep the floor. I need to be cutting hair. <laughs> Eight years old. <laughs> wow. That's okay. a good one. Well, what do you think is your proudest moment of being a hairdresser? I mean, what, do you have one thing that kind of defines your proudest moment? Yes, it's sitting next to me. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. This, I didn't do that on this, purpose, this, by the way. This, this girl changed the lives of thousands of people and yeah. made lives better for them. And mm -hmm. that, that warms my heart. This girl right here, I don't know how, I, you know, I'll tell you how, I'll tell you where she came from, her mother. <laughs> Her, my, my dear late wife was an angel, and she is a clone of her mother. Yeah. Well, thanks, Dad. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree, for sure. Mm -hmm. And it is definitely hard, a family business. And I mean, you know, to say to anyone out there that is thinking about, you know, having a brother or a sister or a, a significant other. I mean, I work with my husband every day. I work with my son every day. I work with my son-in-law every, I mean, my daughter-in-law every day. And I used to yeah. work with my dad and mom mm -hmm. every single day. And, you know, are there trials and tribulations? Absolutely. And uh, I think what you have to recognize is you know what you're good at. So you focus on that and let what they're yeah. good at, then focus on that, yeah. wouldn't you say? It's true. I, like, I train my younger brother. And my younger brother <clears throat> is one of the finest hairbrushers yeah, I've ever true. seen. I've ever seen. That's true. But, and we were partners at one time. But we decided that we would rather be brothers than partners. We couldn't be both. Mm. So uh, now he's a loving brother. I talk to him almost every day. And uh, he does well. He has his own business. He does it his way. I, Candy yeah. does it her way. Yeah, so they're here in town. So yeah. his brother's okay. salon is uh, yeah. my uncle's salon. Mm -hmm. who I'm actually named after is less than, you know, eight, nine miles from our salon. So it's very, very unique and very interesting. Okay. So now that I've got one more thing for you, I want to ask you, Okay. what was the biggest mistake you ever made as a hairdresser? Like if you could come back as, as whether, whether it be in relating to business, if you could have a do over, if you could just go back and say, Gosh, I wish I never had done that. What would it be? That's a hard question, by no, the way. No, I know. It's not hard for me. It, uh, uh, that I didn't have the guts to think bigger. Uh, my thinking was too small. I was too afraid. You know, I had a, a wife and a family uh, that I was responsible for. I was responsible for other people. And I was afraid to take the big step. And uh, I regret that. Uh, uh, I'm not that I'd be any different or whatever. I would have made it work out. But it, 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 it was my regret, my biggest regret. Uh, I, I don't, outside of that. Uh, it was I that, have, is I, that perm you did well, on Friday at three? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I have some of those. Uh, you know, I, I, I say all the time, I have great regrets for some of the things that I've said, but I have bigger regrets for some of the things that I did not say. 
So if I could go back, if there's things I wish I said to people that I did not, and certainly things that I did say that I'm being sorry of, you know. Uh, so that's a good uh, one, Dan. Yeah. It really, it really is. I um. I find the older I get, and I'm going to be 68 in October, and I can't believe it. And I think to myself now, I, I always used to say I'm going to grow old disgracefully, but I think now I mean it. <laughs> so I'm, now I'm getting braver to say things where I'm calling people on what they don't do well. You know, people that are at, that you're associated either in business or in 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 other things, just normal life and everyday things. It's it's important, I think, to let people know what they could do better. And I guess that's still the teacher in me. But yeah, I hear what you're saying there, Jameson. It's hard to say what you really are feeling inside because when we're younger, we don't want to hurt people's feelings. Yeah, well, the biggest mistake, the biggest mistake a boss can make is not saying job well done. You know, mm -hmm. and there goes, you go back to, you can go as far as you want to, as long as you don't care who gets the credit. Yeah. The, the biggest problem with the hairdressing, hairdressing industry is ego. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the biggest problem. Well, we all got one. It's yep. how you dis, dis, disguise it is what's important, you know. So. Well, you've always given with your hand down and not your hand up, yeah. you know. And I it's think that's something that if I could say yeah. one of your one of your traits is that, you know, our our salon sort of circle of life was in Georgia, you don't have to go to beauty school. And of course we hire tons of people from beauty school. I never went to beauty school. And um, learning from my father, going to Europe, learning, coming back, being uh, fortunate to break bread with some greats. But I think when you have a culture of training and education where you spend a lot of time on each other, um, I think ultimately that's why people work with you and not for you. Mm -hmm. and, and I think training training leads to that and then obviously leading by example. I'd like to ask you one question about this generation. Right, one one, one thing uh -oh. I want to say before we go any further. Okay. The teacher always yeah. learns more than the student. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's true. All right. You want That's to ask true. me what? Well, um, I just want to ask you one question about this generation. Um, if you could give a nugget, as Chris says, of advice of um, being a hairdresser for 60 years and that longevity, you know, take away all the obstacles and things like that, that, you know, we all overcome, everybody has obstacles. What would you tell a hairdresser that's burnt out maybe 20 years in this industry that's kind of flailing around and what would you tell the new hairdresser? Like, obviously we've kind of got two sides of people that we're constantly coaching. The new that are coming through and then the ones that have already been here and are kind of flat. Could you give us any bits of nuggets of advice or inspiration? Well, to me, the, the thing I never understood about the hairdressing industry is why everybody wasn't in it. <laughs> it true. is the most fabulous, fabulous in it. Can you, you know, what we sell is happiness and there's no greater reward in life than put a smile on somebody's face. I mean, that's, and, and, and a client, when she comes in the front door, she's hurting. So what a client needs, uh, what a lady needs when she's hurting is tenderness. And it is the, the hairdressing industry is the only industry where we can touch, I mean, besides the medical, but where we can actually touch people and not get arrested or something, you know. It, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I've seen, uh, uh, I, I have a, a saying that my grandkids that I play golf with all the time, that when I see a cart girl or somebody on the golf course, I always say, I, I say, 
I asked him, I said, do you get tired of people telling you how beautiful you are? And one of my grandkids once said, this past weekend said to me, he said, Papa, I finally get it. I get it. He said, you're just trying to make somebody feel a little better. I said, <clears throat> I said to my grandson, I said, you know how that started? I said, I said that to a lady one time in the salon and she started crying. And I said, oh, ma'am, I'm sorry if I said something wrong. She said, no, nobody ever told me I was beautiful before. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just the little things. And the young people, if they get in tune to that, they'll go, wow, this business is so untouched. It's ridiculous. Yeah. You're looking at it. <laughs> I mean, this lady started in her garage and, and has built a multi-million dollar organization. She has trainers all over the world. I mean, uh, uh, it's unlimited what you can do in this business. That's true. But I think that the one thing you always would tell me when I was having a bad day is get up and go to class. Yeah. get up go to class get some mm -hmm. education That's all it takes. And, it's, um, and then I think the one saying that I love the most that you always taught me was to spend major time mm -hmm. with major people mm -hmm. and minor time with, with minor mm -hmm. people correct you know correct. spending that time with the major people was you know when you don't like what's coming into your life look what you're putting out you know, look in the mirror. Those are all some great yeah. things. You yeah. taught me a lot, Pop. I really yeah, appreciate well, all those things. Uh, listen, listen, listen. I'm the student. I learn from you every day. Well, that's <laughs> and, good. And listen, here's the deal. If you spend too much time looking back, you can't see where the hell you're going. <laughs> back, you got to look forward. Always, you know, forward, forward, forward. And, you know, <clears throat> Every day I ever worked in the salon before I sold it to Candy, I'd spend any spare time I had walking through the salon to see what I could do to make it better. You know, I used to call it not, it's not the elephants, it's the fleas. And I'd look for fleas, for little things that would make it better. Make your business better. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, you used to say, have you ever been bitten by an elephant? Yeah. <laughs> be like, no. Well, right. you would remember if you were bitten by an elephant, but it's the little fleas that get yeah, you right. in your business. So yeah. that's awesome. Jameson, I mean, your your life sounds to, to the people that uh, don't personally know you, sounds incredible. You were married to the most beautiful lady. You had a great opportunity early in life. You took it. Then you had a daughter who uh, wanted to follow in your in your footsteps and bought the salon from you. Can you help us? Um, like right now, obviously, this past year has been the most difficult year for everyone on this planet. What does Jameson do when the going gets tough? Well, <clears throat> my seven words to success. Show up on time, ready to work. When the coronavirus hit, this girl went to work. Do you remember? She had classes, she was there, she was there, she said, she went to work. So show up on time. Well, what do you do, Dad? What do you do when the going gets tough? What do I do when the going you gets You read tough? another book? Yeah. No, he goes on the golf course. I read you know, <laughs> two, three books a week. Yeah. He's an avid reader, which is interesting because we're both dyslexic and he didn't read his first book until he was 40 years old. So it's interesting. Yeah. Well, in retirement now, he's got all these grandchildren and everything mm -hmm. else, but he still manages to come in the salon and tell me all the things I need to do. Yeah. And you know what? The, the, he tells you all about all those fleas. The, the last time they saw me coming, they locked the door and cut out the light. I, I don't know why they did that. I, can't, I wonder why they would do something. Yeah. Well, <laughs> who knows, Jameson, when you're there from the goodness of your heart, you came to sweep the floor and make it well, You know, when, when I'm around candy, my thoughts are 
God, I wish I'd have thought of that. Oh, you well, know, that's sweet. You know, because I was here and now she is here. And in the hairdressing industry, for what I the way I knew it, I probably I couldn't work today. I mean, I, I couldn't do the work that they there's no demand for my type of work anymore. You know, they're all dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the, the things that Candy is doing now would be a, a new education for me. If I had to, for some reason, go back to work tomorrow, the first thing I would do would be enroll in her school and let her teach me the type of hairdressing that is required now, you know, to move my train forward. And believe it or not, he's pretty good on his phone too, watching all these fabulous, listening to podcasts and watching uh, yeah, YouTube. So I'm, I'm pretty hoping, impressed. I watch all the time, hoping somebody will men mention my name. <laughs> but I hear a lot of candy show. I don't know candy show. Until now, Jameson. Now you can watch yourself in this in this um, interview. You just go onto YouTube Iconics YouTube Live channel. You can watch yourself all the time. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to share his story. And I just want to say personally, um, it's quite an honor to be your daughter. And not only for the reasons of he was a great hairdresser and a wonderful, uh, a wonderful business leader and uh, iconic in so many ways, but more importantly, you know, he always taught me that life is short and soon to pass and only the things done with love will last. And I appreciate you teaching me that, that no matter what you do in life, whether you're the best hairdresser or whether you own your own salon, whether you own your own school, um, when you do it from the heart, you'll have sustainability. And I think that's why he's had yeah. 60 great years of hairdressing behind the chair. And, and you've taught us all so much, Dad, about what that looks and feels yeah. like. Thank you. And well, thank you. But money, money is not a motivator. Yeah, never money, has been. Money is just energy. That's all it is. It, and it's never, ever, ever my motivator. Never. It's interesting you say that, Jameson, because money doesn't get you to the golf course. Um, but I think that, again, is something that with, with young people, when they're starting out in beauty school, they think that the minute they stop beauty school, they're going to have, you know, somebody call them up on the phone the next day and offer them some unbelievable job. And goodness knows, does that happen, Joseph, at all? Yeah, yeah you know, uh -oh, Joseph. excuse me, Joseph. Uh, Joseph. Years, years, <laughs> sorry, years, years past, I uh, would speak at beauty schools. You know, it was an honor to speak at their graduation or something like that. And one of the questions I always had for them, like, where are you going to work when you leave here? And people would say, well, I'm going with Mary Jane. I'm going down here. It's close to home. I'm going because they have a pretty salon. And I tell them, no, 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 no. Find the salon with the greatest educational program. Mm -hmm. That's where you want to go. OK. Oh, that's all that's all. I'm sorry. That's OK. There's, there's a little blip. You know, um, I have been writing profusely. And I'm glad I got a new pen. Uh, I, Jameson, I'm a talker. I am a talker. I am born from a German barber who was a barber in World War II, was a barber on the ship over here to this country. And I was raised playing Tonka trucks on the floor in the barber shop as he was cutting all the hair on all the farmers. And on top of owning a barbershop, he owned a bar. Mm -hmm. So if you were a farmer that came in from plowing all day and you bought a case of beer, you got a free haircut the rest the next day. So we would be thrown in the Studebaker and driven all to all these farms. And all I saw was my dad cutting hair and, and, and shitting around and, and making guys feel good and making them laugh. 
Uh, everything that you just said is profound on top of the fact that you very much look like my dad and I am having a really interesting experience with this whole talk that you and Candy are having right now because one of my greatest accomplishments, my dad just lived about three days to see and hearing what he had said to me about building this 10,000 square foot structure with 60 employees at the time, um, it was really special. Candy, it is so special that yes, life is short and we're only here for so long. And you are sitting next to someone that is not only an icon, but he's your dad and he's a grandpa and he's, there's so much that I still could yet talk to him about. I think that, you know, one of the things that I would love is to know more about that if you were friends with Sassoon and Paul Mitchell, were you one hell of a designer, cutter? Is that where, is that where you were trained? Yeah. Or what was your training in the cutting world? I would take what I, could, what I saw and uh, work at it till I mastered it. You know, when I first saw, Sassoon taught me to use shears of scissors uh, before I was using a razor. Okay. I, I worked at it until I mastered it. So yeah. his training was really visual. Mm -hmm. I think that really, really, I'm mostly, mostly back then, I think they, mm -hmm. they were all inventors and they were all innovators and they were all trying to figure out a different way to approach hair. I mean, I remember one time when my uncle and my dad were in the garage, you know, trying to cut hair with glass, you know, <laughs> they were doing anything they could to just kind of be an innovator sure. back then. Um, and, you know, so dad in the salon, was always the cutter and then he had people who helped him uh, wrap permanent waves or do pull hair through a cap or you know apply the base colors or things like that so I would say other than winning being a Marcel Iron Champion and doing all the competition work I think that mostly back in those days it was the the stylist was more of a cutter like my dad, and then they had people that helped them do the other traits, yeah. such as color and things of that I, nature. I, I probably started that. I probably the first hairdresser behind the chair to ever have it, assistance. Yeah. yeah in, uh, Teams I, that I, did it. I, yeah. uh, I, but, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> so, would you, so are you a master finger waver? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I want, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm coming at you. Well, I won the World Championship in Amsterdam by 3,700 points. Well, that's nice. Nothing like being humble about it. Well, biggest, biggest he, asked me, he asked me a question, I asked him truthfully. You know what, Bigger, biggest still complaint is is griping from having to learn that. And, and I have always taught them that it's really to practice your dexterity and you should be challenging yourself and you should be thinking that tomorrow, you know, Hollywood is calling and they yeah. want you to perform that because they all want to do hair in Hollywood. You know, they see all these YouTuber influencers and that's what they want to do. Chris, to answer the question, that's what the problem is. The biggest problem, Jameson, the biggest problem these days is unicorn color in the United States is still pretty big with the kids. And I don't know if you know Chris Barron, but I recently just had a chat with our friend Chris and he said to me, if I see one more unicorn color on long hair from the back, all curled vertically, he, he's like, I'm just going to die. I'm just going to spit. And we're stuck. Javidson, we're stuck. I'm an advocate through 30 schools and more. I'm trying to get the world back to where it, the design is so important. Not that color isn't, but you got to build the house before you can paint it inside it and accessorize it. I so. Agree. So before I die, and I've missed two chances, so I've been given a little bit more life to try, my, my biggest challenge right now is 
we've got to get and, and I've got them. I've got all the, the icons pulling for me. So um, I got a good group, but that is the biggest issue is the YouTubers that all they do is color and I, and no offense I think to colorists. I'm swinging though, Justin, <clears throat> I think. I think 2021 personally is going to be the year of the haircut. And I think a lot of that is coming from the fact that having been quarantined, a lot of women are growing out their natural colors. And so they're cutting their hair off to get rid of that. So from a trends perspective, I mean, I, I just have to say my numbers from a teaching perspective, I'm teaching a lot more cutting classes. Oh, uh, all right. Then, I am calling you. We are yeah, cahooting. Because, because I think that it's going to be the year of the haircut. I think people are coming back to understanding that not everything is long layered and curled, you know, and, it, and, and I back with their hands in it. And now we've got, yep. the, you know, and um, I, it, and I, not to interrupt you, but what was really interesting is I didn't, I tried to watch the Queen's Gambit, was it the Queen's Gambit? Is that what it was called? On Netflix? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, apparently her hair is nothing new to us, but that's the direction to which I guess in the next couple of years, which would be great because haircuts like yours. But anyway, you know, I just, just wanted to... Um, Joseph, to your point, and, and also what you were talking about, where, you know, we're stuck in this era of the unicorn hair, the long hair and the curls. Um, I believe that through Iconics, through our Iconics chain reaction, we will hit a handful of people. We won't hit everyone because not everyone is interested in the historical side of our industry or what's happening, who did it, how was it invented, why was it invented. Not everyone is interested in that, but for the handful that are, they are going to be our icons of the future. And that's why we have to continue doing this. Amen, yeah, Chris. amen, well, amen, well, Chris. Well, well yep. Well said. Before the world die. <laughs> Pinkies in the middle. Pinkies in the middle. Love it. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, Candy, you got one more question to wrap it up for your old papa, which I, I love and adore. Question. You want to ask me anything, Dad? Oh. Normally, he say, he says uh, I'm going to ask. I will not repossess. Right, the business. <laughs> Have you got a question? I don't have a question. Okay, we've got a question. I have a comment. You know, so here, here we go. Um, it's a question coming in. Yeah. Hold your, hold your comment, Jameson. Yeah, just for one second. So, quote, I predict bobs will be the most popular trend of 2021, whether it's shoulder length bobs or blunt bobs, bobs are definitely on the rise, says Heather. As for the style she's putting her money behind, it's blunt bobs all the way. They're chic, they're timeless, and they take years off you. And Candy is wearing it, and look how amazing she looks. And it's true. And to me, and thank you for that, Heather, um, to me, the hardest haircut to do is a perfect blunt bob with a fringe. Yes, yes. I wish I could take my own head off and cut it myself sometimes. You know? I'd love to cut your hair, Candy. <laughs> Haircut to do. And I agree with you. I wish I could take my head off and cut my hair myself. What do you disagree with? Well, the, the bob is the hardest to cut. The, the reason it's hard to cut is that people try to, uh, to do it with a client sitting down. Yeah. If you stand the client, it becomes very easy. Oh, hold on, hold on one second. Jameson, how tall are you? <laughs> Six two. Six two. All right. And I'm five foot three. If I stand a client up, I can't even reach their waist. Well, we'll get you a box. Yeah, you know something. <laughs> Jameson, Jameson, can you please, um, we need you to create, invent, and name a stepping stool for rising. Okay. 
<laughs> yeah. I actually teach a student in Portland that's uh, smaller than you, yeah. Chris, that stands on a little thing and stands yeah. her guest yeah. up. Because we're French cutters, which is very different. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of parametric type of yep. hair cutter. And so because of that, that's why he's saying, you know, standing the client up so that you can see the silhouette, like an artist who looks directly, uh, you know, at a canvas instead of a canvas laying on a table. So just no, to explain I, I, why he's saying that, I, I, you know, a good, a good push there, dad, for French cutting. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. I'm all about cut. Appreciate, appreciate that nod to French, French Academy here in Atlanta. Wow. <laughs> I completely agree with you. And you gotta you gotta work in natural fall and, and all of those things. And by far the best way is to be to do it standing up. You're so right, Jameson. Thank you. Oh I still you think 18? it's a hard haircut to do. How old are you? 18? Me. You look like a teenager, yeah. No, she's 68. And, and your father above you there in the picture is he looks my age. <laughs> It's okay. It's okay. When I come out to take you out for dinner, we'll take yeah, your dad right. along, but we'll He's keep him in the, the car. Yeah, we'll okay. keep him in the car. Hey, you come out and gladly pick up the yeah. kick. He's gonna take the bill now. Yeah. yeah. Either keep him in the car or bring him the bill. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so, Thank so you. much. Thank you. And Candy, it's always wonderful to spend time with you. And it's such a pleasure and an honor to meet you, Jameson. And you absolutely are an icon in our industry. And we are so honored that your word has now been heard coming from your mouth. And Thank that, you. yeah, that's what's so um, important because it's not just what we say, it's how we say it. It's the conviction that we say it with. And you, you are amazing. I wish that you'd been my dad, so I'm totally jealous. It's that not too late. I'll adopt you now. <laughs> Some days you can have him, okay? <laughs> well, it's a lot of people have said about me uh, that 50% uh, of what Jameson says you need to listen to and the other 50% is just a bunch of BS. So uh, no, that's, yeah, not true. Yeah. that's not true. You have to take what you want. I would to. listen to the bullshit part. <laughs> Actually, he was pretty reserved. I'm going to be honest with you. You, you know, yeah. you, you get him on a roll, and sometimes I'm like, Dad, Dad, okay, take it down. Uh, you know what? Tell me what he thinks, um, for sure. Candy, Chris, what do you think about this? Jameson knows quite a few icons in the industry. Why don't we ask Jameson if he would like to do a chain reaction and we could find an icon that he may want to interview. Jameson, what, who do you think that you'd want to interview? Joseph, Joseph, I would agree with you, but the two names he mentioned are no longer alive. This is my icon. <laughs> yeah. This is my icon. He was going to say all of his icons are dead. That's yeah. what he was going to say. Yeah. Come on. Well, that's true. Like, no, that's true. Don't say that, Dad. That's true. That's true. Actually, I'm he has a few. He has a few. I, I, have a, How, I have a few that I think would be oh, a really yeah, good for you. You've got to know a few. I mean, you must know Dwight yeah. Miller. Oh, yeah, yes. I know, I know All of them. A lot of people I look up to. Yeah. We'll make that happen. How about just it? Just saying. Just let's saying. Start, start thinking caps on and make that happen. Yeah. yeah. Well, guys, thank you all so much for making this come to uh, such uh, a beautiful place of integrity and, and, and fun and happy. And I love the fact that you're documenting this. It's really great. You know, it's, it's a sad thing that it's taken us all this long to, I know. to do this. I mean, we should have been doing this all along. I think of all the people I would love to sit back and listen to. And I know. Right now, might not oh, think goodness. it's a big deal, but... 20 years from now, they, they will think it's a big deal. <laughs> when Absolutely. they can go back and look at this and say, wow, I knew them when. Yeah, right. Candy, yeah, Candy, Chris, I think we're all still gonna be around when there's a big red carpet rollout in Hollywood, because you never know. This is this is I think some of these documentaries non-hairdressers would love to listen to. Do you know what I mean? It's like reading a people magazine and reading about the background on someone's life and how they got started. I just, yeah, I, I have to agree with you as we continue to accumulate and roll 
um, it's really turning into something really hot and special. And, and I really love it, the relationships and everything. So you passed this on. I'm Jameson. It was so amazing to meet you. I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled. Uh, I want to look up your work. I want to see some of the things you've done. Candy, if you could maybe share. I mean, I will. I have the, ha the hairdressing and all the wigs and everything. I mean, that's what I do. That's what I love. So I would love to just be inspired by some of that. Totally. Come and I have a, have a shitload of stuff I wrote down. <laughs> I mean, really. And I'll quote you after the end of all of them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so. wonderful. Thank you so, so Thank you. much. Thank you. Have a fantastic night. Joseph, we'll be in touch to teach that class for you, okay? Candy, I'm going to get your number as we get off of the Zoom, and then I'll be contacting you really soon. I promise. All right. Okay. All right. Thanks, you guys. Peace. You guys come to Atlanta. I'll pick up the check. I'm coming to Atlanta. Come now I'm coming to Atlanta. Spends it all. Yeah. <laughs> all, right. all right. I'm coming. Oh, all right, you. you guys. Thank you so much.